Hi, good evening class. This is uh, Mr. Simon, uh, Chemistry Unit 2. I'm excited about using this forum to review the lectures that are posted on Moodle. And um, the idea is to make it short so that you don't have to spend a lot of time watching it, but more importantly to focus on key areas of the content material. So we most of this we already covered in class so I'm just gonna go down to around the area where we stopped uh, and we were on filtration just a recap of reverse osmosis it is a type of filtration um, but because it uses pressure it's actually able to filter out even salt um, and it uses a very uh, impressive membrane Now, we spoke about that, that it's able to uh, get out these all salts, but not the gases. Um, chemical uh, treatment, we looked at that, the different types of coagulants, um, what coagulants are, they clump materials together in what we call uh, flocculation. Now it's flocculation results in clumps of large particles called flocks. Uh, disinfection, we looked at different types, chlorine gas, uh, even bromine is used in some some circumstances and uh, chlorine dioxide and the, the consequences the pros and cons of using either approach uh, desalination then because your syllabus outlines the importance of of knowing what desalination is now it's a range of different techniques that that's geared towards removing salt so any technique that involves that it would be considered desalination so you have two major types, distillation and reverse osmosis. Uh, both of them we looked at. Um, you know that um, when distillation refers to heating, the actual substance collecting vapor, um, and then using that, whereas reverse osmosis um, is what we started off with, with the membrane, and you're pushing water against the gradient. Okay. And this goes through the, the steps all right uh, the brine effluent is about twice as salty as the seawater um, so this is actually environmental concern not a step but an environmental concern and um, you want to be careful when you take the water in um, because of the damage it can cause to um, organisms as it, it uh, the suction pulls in the water now it says here that desalination is common in places like the Middle East and the Caribbean, you can imagine why. You know, because we don't have uh, access to large reserves of, of fresh water, uh, with the exception of maybe Guyana and Dominica. All right, uh, other purification techniques, sedimentation, we mentioned that. Um, boiling water is effective because it can kill most organisms and vaporize most chemicals. There are some things that won't vaporize. Uh, metals are examples. You don't expect a metal to just evaporate off. The UV light is a defective technique. Um, this wavelength you should take note of. It's useful in killing uh, bacteria. Um, although you ch you know, you're probably not going to get viruses or cysts and worms. Um, if you are targeting removing the organic compounds, you can use 185. Sorry, uh, 185, and that's going to help to oxidize organic compounds. The benefit of using UV light, just like aeration, it doesn't leave any sort of residual cleaning agent, so that's very useful. Though when you mentioned that, um, that it's kind of a mild way of of um, cleaning the pool, um, and the benefit is that it it, it 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 leaves a better taste compared to chlorine. Aeration, um, the idea is to to uh, elevate the water into the air and that helps to uh, insert dissolved oxygen it helps to take away odors and um, I'll show you a picture of it this is an example you see that it's really just kind of agitating the water upwards and that allows water to enter in now this shows the steps of desalination uh, in a summary you have the ocean water which we know as the salt um, and then there's pretreatment, which would involve moving 
how we larger particles and so on that's going to affect the reverse osmosis now something you want to pay attention of now if attention to if it is that the, the water contains large particles then you don't want a situation where the membranes for the reverse osmosis can get clogged so you want to do initial filtration to remove large particles before you get into the um, reverse osmosis and then you can move into processing where you can add um, things that would enhance the quality of the water and the taste dissolve oxygen and uh, why is it important well dissolve oxygen or deal for short uh, is what we use to measure the dissolved oxygen content we know oxygen is tremendously important for respiration uh, among other things uh, water generally has a range of 0 to 18 ppm now the field trip kind of highlighted the need or not really need but it reminded us that it's important to be versed with using ppm in industry um, so PPM really is just parts per million um, and we never really went into a lot of detail uh, in terms of how this translates to the units uh, parts per million just means that for example 18 PPM is you have 18 parts in a million if you look at something like gram and uh, cm cube okay that would sort of be one to one all right but what if you had milligram in a centimeter and then it would be not one to one but you would have something that's a thousand times uh, less if I can put the thousand there you have a t something that's a thousand times less in the same space all right so in terms of concentration ppm is a measure of concentration so if you had one milligram in one centimeter then you see that this is a thousand times less than than the initial equivalent because grams and cm is pretty much on the same level as it relates to units so if you had a milligram in a centimeter you see that um, it would be a thousand times less but uh, what if you had a microgram then a microgram is a thousand times less than a milligram so that's another thousand so if you had a thousand times a thousand that's actually a million so an example of a one pass million would be like putting one microgram of something in one cm cube okay that's where we get the idea of million from because you see that um, compared to and I really don't have to write all these zeros in but compared to when it was one gram and one cm that was pretty much one part in one part but um, if you have something that's a, a million a factor of a million less then it would be one uh, this one microgram would be one part in what is sort of like a quantity of a million all right another example is if, if you didn't go down to microgram if you stayed at milligram and perhaps took this upwards to uh, a thousand cm cube or a liter uh, one milligram in a liter is also considered part per million because this milligram is going a factor of 10 to the 3 in one way and this liter is going 10 to the 3 in the other way so it's overall it's 10 to the 6 which is a million um, and you could google it and you see more examples and parts per billion would just be the difference was um, uh, 9 points away using grams and cm cube as a reference um, another Another example would be parts per billion. Uh, if you had one microgram in a liter, that'd be an example of parts per billion. Okay, but more importantly, you have the range. If you get um, so three to five ppm, so you know that you can also say uh, three milligram, um, three milligram per liter to five milligram per liter. Uh, which is the same as saying 3 ppm to 5 ppm uh, that level of dissolved oxygen content is, is fine okay but if you go below that if you go below 2 ppm so every time you see 2 ppm you can think uh, 1 milligram per liter so if you go below 2 milligram per liter then uh, it can actually result in the death of the organisms um, 
So for example, insufficient oxygen, which is a uh, condition called uh, hypoxia, um, it can actually result in um, or result from decomposition of organic matter. And uh, the reason why we say that is because uh, decomposition actually is a form of respiration and it would actually consume oxygen. Okay, now here are some factors that would actually decrease the oxygen content. One is respiration, uh, like I just mentioned. The second one is temperature. As temperature increases, the dissolved oxygen content decreases. And eutrophication is a combination of all of this, where you have uh, excess nutrients, which is a key point. And then that excess nutrients would actually stimulate algal growth. You expect the algal, uh, algae to respire which will actually decrease your oxygen content. Um, that decreased oxygen content would in turn make it difficult for plants and uh, fishes and so on to uh, thrive in that pond or water body and so it can result in the death of a lot of aquatic life. Furthermore, plants initially they were responsible for photosynthesizing and producing more oxygen. However, if the bloom, the algal bloom is covering the surface of the water, then that can also impact um, photosynthesis and then we mentioned this how the plants can die that's pretty much what that says here are some categorical sources of water pollution one is municipal, uh, municipal uh, that refers to city pollution uh, that's just another word for city or related to city um, and this results with things like sewage and so on the challenge is if you put sewage um, into public uh, if you just dispose it, because they're saying here, for example, 90% of wastewater is directly discharged into rivers and streams. And that's a problem um, because that sewage can actually contains viruses, bacteria, uh, things that can cause diseases like diarrhea and so on. Here's an example of this gentleman. I don't know if he was in there for fun. I don't know. But... Um, but you understand that you know you could have all kind of things in there. You could have um, all kind of things. We didn't even want to get graphic, but um, you can imagine how dangerous that could be. All right. And um, if if it is that you have contaminants that are biodegradable, the challenge is that the process of uh, degradation will actually consume a lot of oxygen. Agricultural pollutants. We know that you can have pesticides and herbicides. Uh, and the problem with that is that you know these some of the pesticides and herbicides they're not specific uh, they can just target plant life and uh, you can have a situation where the good plants are being affected by it and um, if that's the case then you know that affects photosynthesis finally industrial you can have things like nuclear waste um, an example would be Chernobyl a Chernobyl disaster that happened oil spill you have the Exxon Valdez disaster that happened a few years back we know lead is an issue uh, so here you want to look at the consequences of these things so lead for example can cause brain damage uh, mercury we know that it can have toxic effects and mercury can have an issue with bioaccumulation uh, mining also uses things like cyanide cyanide as you know is poisonous trace metals uh, we don't talk about this so much but they can actually cause pollution and uh, we know that you find trace metals in small amounts in organic materials but when these uh, plants and so on die it releases it suspended matter that just refers to things that uh, they don't dissolve but they actually can cloud the water thermal pollution we mentioned this when we were speaking about the plant in Barbados and that's an issue some ways of dealing with this would be to uh, for example cool the water before you release it or you can channel that hot water to maybe generate electricity or send the hot water to homes and then here are the tests for pollutants uh, phosphate ions you should use um, a molybdate ammonium molybdate uh, with concentrated genetic acid with nitrate ions you can use the brown ring test uh, lead you would use the potassium iodide cyanide you would use what's stated there Finally, I wanted to show you this. This is the thing at these. All right, it's the water uh, water disposal unit. Uh, you just put your bottle in there. That's actually okay. But you put your bottle in there and you pay your ten dollars and you get your five gallons. If you zoom in here, you see the different process and the steps that they use. So you can check it out when you get a chance.
All the best.